Well, hello out there. Welcome to season three of Dome at Home. I'm Scott Young flying solo right now. Mike is away for the summer. And uh, so please bear with me. Normally he's running all the things in the background. Got the, the, the chats and the microphones and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully you can hear me out there. We're coming to you live on Facebook and live on YouTube. So both of those spots should now be seeing me. And uh, sorry for the little bit of test here, but uh, it's our first time running, uh, running the show solo. So um, you don't always see Mike very much during the show. Well, in fact, you never see him, but you don't often hear him, but uh, he does a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. So uh, I'm really missing him right now. Okay. Thank you all for coming. This is Dome at Home, the kickoff of season three. This is the beginning of our summer season. Uh, a few changes for the summer season. As you may know, we're, we're not there on Zoom. We're only doing our uh, programming on Facebook and on YouTube. So you should be able to see us on both of those spots. And hopefully this is all coming through. There we go. Excellent. There we are. Good. Excellent. Okay, I think we're I think we're good now. Sorry for all the uh, the back and forth here, but it did take a little bit of uh, getting this stuff together. Okay, it's really great to be back for the summer. We are going to be checking out uh, what's up in the sky. Today is also a very special day. It's the tenth anniversary of the very last space shuttle launch. STS-135, the Space Shuttle Atlantis, took off 10 years ago today on the very last space shuttle mission ever. We'll be looking back at the space shuttle, which, believe it or not, used to be the big thing in space travel. And uh, now, you know, there are kids that are out there watching the show now that have never seen the space shuttle, don't even know what it is. It's in, it's in the past, like the Apollo program and uh, some of the early days of the space program. So that's a little odd. But uh, for some of you, but it'll be kind of cool to look back. We'll also look at some cool space stuff because there were some neat things going on this week. We are going to start off with a little look at our um, current sky, though. Let's pop over to the sky. We're finally past solstice. The sky is starting to darken a little earlier. There's the trade-off there. Uh, I've noticed a few mosquitoes out there. If you go out right at dusk, there's definitely some, uh, some bug action going. So do yourself a favor, make sure you deal with mosquitoes in whatever your favorite way is, whether that's with repellent or clothing or, or whatever, but uh, it does make it a little bit less fun. So grab your binoculars, grab your, your uh, telescope if you have one, just your eyes, a lawn chair, a friend, and head out and take a look at the sky. Sunsets, ooh, but a little bit after nine right now, but by the time it starts getting dark, um, that sun will set way down in the still way far north of, uh, of the western point. So it's quite uh, far north, sets about quarter after. And as the sky slowly darkens, there will be one thing that appears before anything else. And by 10 o'clock, I would say maybe even by, uh, by quarter to 10, depending on your, uh, your local sky conditions, you should be able to see the first star you'll see at night, the planet Venus. Venus becomes visible right after the sunset. It's over here, it's the brightest thing in the sky, outshines everything else. I still have not seen it this season yet. Some of that is because of weather. Some of that is because the horizon where I do most of my observing from is full of trees and people's houses. This is not very high above the horizon. So if you want to catch Venus, you really do need a nice flat horizon out to your west and northwest. By about 10 o'clock, it starts to become visible. As the night goes on, though, just like the sun did, Venus will set. And by, I would say, 1030, it's probably too low for you to see unless you have a perfectly flat horizon. Right about the time you start seeing the other stars, Venus is going to be pretty much gone. So you got to get out there early. Now, one of the cool things that's happening right now, it's, it's hard for us to see, but right next to Venus is another object in the sky, a really, really faint object. Here, I'll zoom in a little bit here. We'll, we'll get a little bit more of a view. That's the planet Mars. It's still there after all this time. We've been watching it for uh, almost two years now. 
Mars is moving sort of down into the right night after night. Venus is moving up into the left. And so they're going to pass each other sort of the middle of next week, around the 11th, around the 12th. That'll be a good time to get out and see if you can spot um, Venus. And if you have binoculars, that's probably what you'll need to see Mars. Mars is so much fainter, so much farther away, just not as bright. On the 12th, that's a great night to go because the moon will actually be nearby as well. A nice little thin crescent moon. That'll be a challenging observation if you're just using your eyes. But if you have a pair of binoculars, that's just enough extra oomph to pull in those objects. So you might be able to spot those. So keep your eyes open for those over the next, uh, next little while. And of course, check them out anytime that it's clear. Once the sky darkens, Venus and Mars have disappeared. And we're actually heading into the dark weekend of the month. We're close to new moon. I think new moon is actually tomorrow. And so that means there's no moon in the sky to light up the sky. When there's no moon in the sky, that's also a good time to get away from the other lights that we have, city lights, and get to a nice dark location. Because that's when you can really see um, the stars as they were meant to, meant to be seen with uh, just thousands and thousands of stars out there. Sometimes people will drive out of the city to get a good view of the stars, but it'll be full moon night and you can't drive away from the moon. The moon will really brighten up the sky. But if you want a nice dark sky, this is the weekend or the, or the week for it. So if you can get out of the city and uh, check things out. I'm gonna uh, just check over to our chat here and hopefully be able to get uh, some of your comments. I'm juggling about 85 windows here at once. So hopefully we'll be able to see some of this. Um, while we're while I'm uh, getting that going, let's take a look at uh, some of the constellations I'll put up here. The spring constellations are still over there. Very difficult to uh, to uh, spot some of them. Leo is going down very very quickly. Uh, there we go. Oh look, we got lots of lots of comments here. Uh, all right. Oh, we got. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maria from Thompson is there. Beautiful. Uh, Tiffany's spotting, uh, able to see Venus out, out her window, which is fantastic. There we go. Um, and let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, lots of, lots of hellos. It's great to, great to see you all. Oh, Vivian's here. Some of the folks that I remember um, from the very, very first show. Oh, there's Lander. Nice to see you. And our friends from Connecticut. I love the fact that we have some loyal viewers, uh, Hollis from, uh, from Connecticut listening into the show every uh, every week. Okay, there we go. Just making sure that uh, our chat was working. All right. If we move off to the southern part of the sky, we're really deep into the summer constellations now. And uh, we've talked about them pretty much each week for a while, but you get um, the summer triangle is starting to get nice and high in the sky, made of the three bright stars in three separate constellations here. But the summer triangle, beautiful view of, uh, of that coming up in the southeast. You'll be seeing that all summer long. I want to focus a little bit on the constellation at the southern end of the summer triangle here. This is called Aquila. And if we zoom in a little bit, again, we're using Stellarium here, the great free planetarium software. I don't know how this looks like an eagle. I mean, maybe sort of. Uh, to me, I've always actually thought it looked like a stingray. If you connect these stars here, this is sort of like the body of the stingray, like a, a stingray that swims in the ocean, not like a stingray car. Um, and here's like the tail. And there's actually a little, tri a little tail of um, three stars in a row right at the end that I imagine is the stinger of the stingray. So that's kind of how I see Aquila. You can always recognize Aquila because the bright star here, Altair, has a fainter star on either side. It's like it's got a couple of bodyguards or something like that. It really stands out when you're when you're there in the sky. You won't find a bright star with a pair of stars flanking it really anywhere else in that part of the sky. So it helps it stand out. The, the starfish wings here kind of make a nice diamond in the sky and then the long tail here. I'm pointing out the tail because for those of you that are out there using binoculars, uh, and I know we've got a, a number of, of viewers that are out there with binoculars checking things out. Um, there is a lovely little star cluster right at the end of the tail of the stingray here. I'm just going to turn on the what we call the deep sky objects. 
anything that is farther away than the planets that you might want to look at with a telescope we call the deep sky. And that's um, star clusters and uh, nebulae and galaxies and all that kind of stuff. Well, they all have numbers and names and things like that. One of the most famous lists of these deep sky objects is called the Messier list. And there's 110 objects uh, uh, written down by Charles Messier. And we've talked about him in the past. Messier number 11 is a lovely little star cluster right at the end of the tail here. And it's really easy to find because basically you've got this little sort of bent um, line of stars here and then M11 is basically right in a line from there. So if you have your binoculars, to give you a sense, a regular pair of binoculars should fit this whole region all together. So if you're looking at these three stars in your binoculars, M11 should be visible on the right hand side of your field of view. And then when we start to zoom in a little bit, in binoculars, M11 is this beautiful little star cluster. It kind of looks like a, a little cloud with a few stars sprinkled on it in binoculars. And as you look at it and watch it, um, your eyes will sort of start to see a little bit more detail. In a telescope, there's actually about a thousand stars there. And they kind of have the shape of, um, it's kind of a V shape with a, a bright star sort of at the top or at the side over here, I guess. It's kind of like a, a triangle shape. And it reminded somebody of a, of a group of wild ducks in flight. You know, they fly in a V formation. And so this is called the wild duck cluster. It's a really beautiful thing to find in binoculars. Like I say, it, uh, you need probably a dark night for it. You don't want to go out when there's too many lights around because even though there's a thousand stars there, they're all quite far away. And so you need um, your binoculars need to have a sort of good conditions to be able to spot it. It'll be a little bit of a challenge. If you do have uh, the bigger binoculars, I know uh, some of our viewers like Ulrich uh, has, uh, has the, the 70 millimeter binoculars, that'll help for sure. But any binoculars should be able to pull these, this little cluster in. Um, and remember, that's just right at the end of the tail of Aquila the Eagle. So that's something to watch for this summer. We're going to try and provide some of these binocular highlights throughout the, the course of the summer because often in the summer people do get a chance to get out of the city and uh, maybe you're doing camping or maybe you have a cabin or, or maybe you're just getting away for a, a day or so and uh, it is a good time to to see the sky from a really nice dark location it's something you'll never forget even if you just look with your eyes the number of stars out there it it really is mind-boggling and you really feel part of the cosmos really when you're surrounded by stars and no other sources of artificial illumination okay our theme this week is the space shuttle. And the reason for that is that we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the space shuttle's last flight. Oh, I just spotted a couple, uh, one of the comments went by here. Someone was asking, oh, uh, Jasmina was asking, where do you recommend to go to see the stars? Well, the best place is if you own a piece of property out in the middle of nowhere, but very few of us have that. Um, Parks are great. Provincial parks, I mean, I go to Birds Hill a lot. Birds Hill Park is nice and close to Winnipeg and still pretty dark. Um, Beaudry Park on the west end of the city is good. La Barrier Park down south is, is a nice spot. The best skies I ever had was um, way up in Nopaming Park, which is north of Riding Mountain. I was at a place called Blue Lake. My parents used to take us camping there and the campground didn't have electricity yet. So there were literally no lights. And we would go out on the on the water um, in in the boat fishing like at twilight and it was unbelievable some of the best views of the sky that i've ever had have been in a, in a place like that you really need to have a place where not only do you have good skies but you're secure like you're allowed to be there you're not going to have somebody come and kick you off their property or whatever you need to be in a spot where you can be you know safe and comfortable and all those kinds of things go with a friend or or whatever but I've also had great views just by driving along the highway, pulling off onto a side road and, and pulling off the, uh, the road so that you're, you're nice and safe and then just looking out the window. That's a, that's a way, when I, was, when I was younger, I was afraid of the dark, believe it or not. That's awkward for an astronomer, right? Um, and so sometimes I would freak myself out and uh, didn't want to get out of the car. So I just sit in the car, roll the window down and use the binoculars like that. And it was, uh, it was great fun too. Anyway, um, 
Oh, Michelle. Uh, hi, Michelle. Uh, Michelle has posted, uh, they have their solar scope out, watching the sun and listening to Dome at home. Nice. Uh, Michelle has been taking some amazing images of the sun. I'd like to get her on the show, actually, maybe uh, sometime this summer to talk about that, because um, normally we say don't look at the sun, but there are safe ways to do it. And the sun is actually doing some really interesting things. So, uh, Michelle, let's talk about that for uh, maybe a future week. We'll see what your schedule is like. Um, Ulrich has asked, uh, can we see the spring constellations in fall in the early, early morning hours? Yeah, basically you remember the, the constellations are named after the ones that are visible in the, in the early evening. And so the summer constellations are visible in summer in the early evening. You get to see the fall constellations just before uh, morning. And you would see the winter constellations after the sun rises, which of course means we don't see them. So really the only constellations you can't see if you stayed up all night are sort of the ones six months from now. You won't see Orion the Hunter in July, no matter what you do pretty much. Um, okay, oh, um, Melissa's asking about the Northern Cross. Yes, let's go back to, let's go back to our star map here. Normally I do point out the, uh, a little bit more of the constellations here. So let me just get back here, make sure that we're set. There we go. So our summer triangle, there we go. Our summer triangle is made of the three bright stars. There's Altair with the stingray uh, and the, in behind my head over here is the, uh, the tail we were just talking about. Here's Vega up at the top and here's Deneb, uh, the faintest of the three. And Deneb is part of the Northern Cross, which is basically these stars here and then these two here. Now if you add the extra stars, these become the wings of Cygnus the Swan. It's basically the same group of stars just visualized a different way. But uh, to me, these stars are quite a bit fainter, the ones at the end here, but the, the Northern Cross stars do, it looks very geometric and uh, they seem to stand out a little bit more because of that. Okay, let me just uh, make sure here. Oh, do we have any book recommendations? Uh, Pascali has asked, book recommendation for stargazing constellations. We don't always have a phone or computer with you. I absolutely do. Um, the book is called, and in fact, I have one sitting right here. The book is called Night Watch. This is the best book about astronomy in the universe. And no, I didn't write it. And no, I don't get any commission from selling it. Night Watch by Terence Dickinson. Fantastic book. It has constellation maps for each season. It's got close up maps you can use with your binoculars. Talks about the planets, talks about um, all sorts of basically everything that you would need to be a backyard astronomer. If you could only have one book about astronomy, that would be it. So I've seen it at McNally Robinson. Uh, I've seen it at, uh, at Chapters. You can get it online, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic book and I highly, highly recommend it. it. It's better than the manual that came with your binoculars or telescope. It's, it's just fantastic. All right, uh, we are gonna move on here because uh, we're on our summer schedule and then they told me don't talk so much because the show will go too long. Anyway, well, uh, let's see what we can do here. We are going to move on to our anniversary celebration. Ten years ago today, the very last space shuttle launched. This is what rockets used to look like, kids, which is kind of hilarious because now we're back to the original style of rocket with a capsule up on top, and it looks very much like the original things. But in the 70s, and they, they decided, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we had rockets that were reusable? rather than throwing them away each time. And so they put together um, a system, the Space Transportation System or STS, which was basically uh, a big orange fuel tank, which got thrown away every time, but then two solid rocket boosters on the side, the rockets um, on the side here were only used for the first two minutes of flight. And then they parachuted down and were recovered and reused. And then for the astronauts and the, and the payload, they had this space plane and the idea was it would launch up like a rocket, go up into space, drop off its satellites or do whatever, and then it would come and land like an airplane. And the idea was that it would be able to do this every couple of weeks or so. It would just be such an efficient system. They built five of them. And um, unfortunately, it never quite got to that level of reusability because back then it was actually, um, it, well, it's actually quite difficult to have such a big vehicle re-enter the atmosphere. If once you go out into space with the whole thing, it's actually really hard. 
nowadays SpaceX uses its its rocket booster. It only reuses the part that doesn't go into space, the part that just goes up a little bit and then lands again. That's a much more um, easy to solve problem. But the space shuttle was a tremendously complicated and tremendously successful machine. These are some shots from the, the final launch. My, uh, my friend and colleague, Randy Atwood from Toronto was down for the launch. He's uh, one, of, one of Canada's sort of space historians, essentially. Um, if you wanna know about the space shuttles or the Apollo program or any kind of space stuff, Randy's your guy. Um, he went down and got these shots with a, with a sound triggered camera. The sound of the launch made the camera take its pictures because you're not allowed to stand this close because you would get fried, of course. So what does the space shuttle do? Well, it had this whole big par cargo bay that was big enough to fit a school bus in. So if you wanted to take big stuff into space, that's what the space shuttle was for. It wasn't for sending up one or two astronauts or a little satellite or things like that. It was for sending big things into space and to be able to take those big things out of the payload bay and then put them into orbit, there was the Canada arm. And that's of course how Canada got into space. The, the, uh, the, very, the, the very first space shuttle flew without a Canada arm because it was a test flight. The second one had the Canada arm on board and pretty much every other mission with a couple of exceptions of those 135 have all had a Canada arm on board and it was a major part. Without the Canada arm, the shuttle basically couldn't do anything. And it really was Canada's way of getting into space. The space shuttle would launch satellites. It would take up all sorts of uh, other things and the Canada arm would do all of this work. And because we contributed the Canada arm, Canada also got to get some astronauts. And so here's a, here's a great early picture. There's a very young Chris Hadfield in the bottom left there. Uh, his mustache has grown substantially since then. Um, Mark Garneau, the first Canadian in space here. Uh, uh, this picture doesn't have Roberta Bondar on it, who was the first Canadian woman in space, um, but I think she shows up in one of my later pictures. All of these astronauts flew originally on the space shuttle. Later on, when the space shuttle retired, some of the, the more recent Canadian astronauts actually um, went up on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. But there's, there's Roberta right there, first Canadian woman into space. She, uh, she became a staunch environmental activist when she came back. After seeing the Earth from space, uh, it changed her as it changed many people. And uh, she's been a, a, a real active person in terms of sustainability and, and environmentalism. Chris Hadfield went up on the shuttle. He, he flew a few times. He was the first Canadian to walk in space, the first Canadian to command the International Space Station, the first Canadian to uh, play live music with the bare naked ladies while in space. Um, he really pushed the boundaries of, you know, astronauts being open to the public. He was all over social media, just a super nice guy. Uh, I, I really, have enjoyed uh, chatting with him the, the couple times that I've been lucky enough to host him at the at the museum. And, uh, you know, there he is doing the first spacewalk. There's something pretty cool about seeing your country's flag on a spacewalk out, up there in space. Here's the new astronauts. Uh, on the right here, this is uh, David St. Jacques. He was up on the space station for a few months. And um, we have uh, Jeremy Hansen's been to Winnipeg, the guy in the far left there. And uh, this is Jenny Seide and, oh geez, I'm blanking on the other person's name. That's terrible. I am, I'll, I'll get that in the chat in a, in a moment. But uh, these are the four who are basically competing for the first lunar flight. Oh, I hope that ping was somebody uh, checking in with the name of the, uh, of the other astronaut because I'm just having a, a blank here. There we go, let's see. No, unfortunately not. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, Josh Kutrick, thank you. Thank you, Melissa, yes. Um, so I'm not sure who's gonna be going. Jeremy Hansen was the backup to David Stenjak's uh, space station flight. So he's technically next in line, but we'll have to see what happens. Um, anyway, all of this, basically came about because of our contribution to the space shuttle program uh, with the Canadarm and then eventually the Canadarm 2, the Canadarm 3. 
if the space shuttle didn't do anything else than launch this one thing though, it would have been worth it. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. It was too big to put into space with any other launcher at the time really. And so the space shuttle was the only way to get a giant telescope like this into orbit. The, the Hubble Space Telescope, arguably one of the most successful scientific instruments of all time. And it didn't work. When they launched it, there was a problem. And so without the space shuttle, that couldn't have been fixed. It would have been a, a billion dollar disaster. But the space shuttle went up there, grabbed the thing again, changed out some optics, put in new instruments, and in fact has updated the instruments several times over the years, keeping the, the Hubble right at the cutting edge of technology. You couldn't do that with the current rockets that we have today. Um, the shuttle was really designed to do a few things and do them well, and it was designed to haul big cargo and then service that cargo. So not just the Hubble, but things like the Galileo space probe that went to Jupiter. Uh, this is the Magellan spacecraft that went to Venus. Uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which is like the X-ray equivalent of the Hubble Space Telescope, seeing black holes and supernovas and things like that. The shuttle also docked with the Russian space station Mir, and that was the precursor, of course, to our International Space Station. In fact, some of the pieces of Mir, there are basically mirror images still part of the Russian part of the International Space Station. And the whole space station was built using the space shuttle and the Canadarm and the Canadarm 2. Literally, we wouldn't have a space station without the shuttle. That was really its primary job. Now it's retired. It's gone. And folks like me, like I, I love the space program. I love watching what's going on. We're looking at these new types of, of rockets that are going up and they're able to put three or four people in them and they're able to bring along, you know, a little bit of cargo or things like that. What's going to happen? How are we going to build the next space shuttle? Are we going to, or the, pardon me, the next space station? Is there going to be a new space shuttle that we'll have to develop? Will there be other technologies? Hard to say, but I mean, the space shuttle really was an amazing time for the space program. And for folks like me that were just a little bit too young to remember the Apollo moon missions, this was our whole space program. This, this is what I grew up watching, counting down and stuff like that. And I've made countless models of them and I've made a Lego version and you know, just the idea of the space shuttle was space for me. So it was kind of sad when it went, went away, but it was understandable. It was very complicated, very expensive to maintain. There were some problems with it. There were a couple of, uh, of incidents over the past uh, where, where there were accidents and things like that. So it really wasn't a sustainable model. I think with SpaceX and with these other companies where they're reusing certain parts of it to save money, but they're not reusing the parts of it that keep the crew alive. That's, you know, they're, they're uh, well, I guess they're, they're going to, but the, uh, the orbiter itself, the space plane is such a big piece that to reuse it, you're almost rebuilding it each time. So it, it was a, a, a great thing. I doubt we will ever see another space shuttle space plane again in our lifetimes, but still, um, it was, uh, it was a very wonderful thing. And here's a, here's a shot that I took, uh, from my backyard. This is the International Space Station moving across the sky in about 10 seconds of exposure. And then this is Space Shuttle, uh, uh, th sorry, this is Space Shuttle Discovery, uh, the one before Atlantis that, um, was going across the sky. They had just undocked from the space station. So I got to see them in the sky. That was Discovery's last flight. It was cloudy the week of um, Atlantis's last flight, so I didn't get a chance to see them in the sky. But uh, great program, lots of really cool stuff. And like I say, Canada's space program really was built around and through the, the space shuttle. So the Canadian space program owes a, a big debt of gratitude to the shuttle. And uh, if you get a chance to see, all, all of the remaining shuttle orbiters are in museums now, and you can go and check them out. There's one in... Um, California and there's one in Virginia, I think, and it's a uh, it's a a wonderful machine. Uh, here's a couple of questions. Um, Jasmine is saying, were the spaceships always built that way? No, um, the uh, the original rockets were were literally just like one rocket with a capsule on top, 
And as things started to get bigger, it turned out to be easier to have a few rockets that were connected together. So that's where you got the space shuttle, where you had a couple of rockets on the side and then a few rockets built into it. Now we're kind of back to the regular, um, you know, single rocket with a capsule on top again. Uh, Terry's asking, did the old space station return to Earth? The, uh, the Mir space station did deorbit in 1990. It, uh, they knew that it was sort of past its warranty life and things were starting to go wrong with it. And they knew the space, the International Space Station was coming along. So eventually they shut it all down, got all the crew out, brought them all home. And then they turned the rockets on and made it crash down into the ocean so that it all burned up. So uh, they, they made sure it didn't land on anybody, which was, uh, which was a pretty good idea. All right. Oops, we jumped ahead one image too quickly because I have to first say, Space Sorry, I had to hear Mike's voice there and uh, get the theme music. There's another space station up there, the Chinese space station, Tianhe. And uh, just last over the last week, they did their first spacewalk from Tianhe. Two Chinese astronauts went outside the, the space station for the first time and um, they hooked up a bunch of basically all the handles that they're going to need for future spacewalks. They attached some things to the robot arm. This is part of the robot arm right here. And um, so they're going to use that to be able to move around the whole space station and things like that. It was a big deal for, for the Chinese space program. The crew is supposed to be up there for three months and then they'll come back and the space station will run automatically for a little while until they send the next crew up. So a very cautious program. They're not jumping ahead very quickly, but it's nice to see that we, we have more than one spacecraft up there. And uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty exciting to, uh, to know that, you know, we are slowly getting out there into space. Okay, we have a time for a couple of questions here. Uh, Michelle's asking, have they fixed Hubble? Yeah, so the Hubble Space Telescope, the optics got fixed sort of that first year and they put in new cameras and things like that, but it runs on the computers. And the computers, like if you, it was launched in 1990. If you remember what your computer was like in 1990 compared to what it's like now, they just don't hold up. Now, if you take that computer and stick it out in space where radiation can hit it and um, you know, it, uh, it gets even worse. So the Hubble's computer failed and it shut down. And so they thought, okay, well, that's a problem. Let's see what we can do about that. They were trying to get it back and running and stuff like that. Then they were gonna to switch to the backup computer because you know NASA always has a backup. The backup computer has also failed. The last that I heard, and I have to admit this is three or four days old. I haven't seen anything else on it. Both computers were still down. And so the Hubble is basically in suspended animation right now. So it is not currently doing science. I hope that they'll get it back. It's predecessor or um, its successor, the um, next generation space telescope, the Webb Space Telescope doesn't go up until end of the October or something like that. So it would be nice to get it, keep it working. Um, yeah, Ulrich, you were just uh, just asking, is there, are there plans for the new uh, Hubble telescope? Well, the, the, the Webb Space Telescope has a mirror that is about, um, oh, I think it's an eight meter mirror that folds out. It's a big segmented thing. It's basically going to be about a hundred times as powerful as the Hubble Space Telescope. Now the Hubble Space Telescope showed us the universe like never before. And so this instrument will be a hundred times more sensitive. That's going to be amazing. We're going to learn so many things from what comes down from that telescope. It may revise everything that we know about the universe. Um, or it may confirm everything that we know about the universe, but just in more detail. We really won't know until it gets up there. But it, uh, it's been sort of delayed over a number of years. It was very expensive. It's very complicated. It's very big. And now they're getting ready to launch it towards the end of the year. So it would be nice to have them both up there at the same time, still functioning, if Hubble could stay up there. I always thought it would be cool if the space shuttle could go up and pick up the Hubble and then bring it back down to Earth so that we could bring it back. Unfortunately, you can't actually land the space shuttle with the cargo bay full of stuff. You can bring a little bit of stuff back, but not big stuff like the Hubble Space Telescope. Basically, it would, it would not work. So unfortunately, Hubble will eventually turn on the, the rockets that they attach to it back, um, 
in the one of the previous space shuttle missions and it will deorbit and come down and burn up over the pacific ocean as well and that will be uh that will be a sad day all right we have uh a few other things just to cover um i did want to let everybody know we are running every thursday at seven um facebook and youtube um and uh, please do fill out the survey if you don't mind. I put a link at the beginning of the comments and I'll drop it into YouTube as well. Um, let us know if you had any issues with, um, you know, accessing the, the program or uh, commenting or things like that. I know that we had some times where some people weren't able to comment in different areas. So please let us know. We're trying to get all that figured out. We will also be um, doing some live astronomy events over the course of the summer. We for sure will be doing something um, for the Perseid meteor shower in August. And we've got another couple of events that we're they're working on lining up so that we can see the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter and things like that over the course of, uh, of the summer. So visit the Manitoba Museum, subscribe to the, uh, to the e-news, which you can do right on the front page and you'll find out when we're doing all that kind of stuff. Um, or you can like us on Facebook, Head over to YouTube, give the YouTube channel a like for the Manitoba Museum as well. All of those things help us to, uh, to keep track of um, how many people are, are watching and enjoying the program and things like that. And let's see, I have uh, one more thing. I just wanted to fast forward our sky a little bit, just as a reminder, our morning sky is currently where we're starting to see the planets. And, and actually when I say morning, it's just after midnight, the planets are starting to rise. So let me just get our, uh, there we go. When you're looking at the sky, even I would say even 1230 or so, off in the Southeast, Jupiter is already rising and Saturn is already rising. They don't get very high above the horizon. Again, you'll need to sort of stay clear of any kind of um, trees or things like that but it does, they, they do both become visible and uh, they'll just be rising earlier and earlier as the uh, summer goes on. So we'll watch for those planets. And uh, over in the same general area, we also have um, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. And so we'll be talking about those planets as well. Even though you can't see them with the unaided eye, you certainly can get a look at them through telescopes. And so we'll, we'll be bringing those views to you as well. That about wraps us up for this particular show. Next week, we will be talking about Pluto. Pluto will actually be at its, what we call opposition, the time when it's kind of brightest and closest to us. We'll talk about Pluto and all of its other uh, dwarf planet friends out there um, and get into the whole, is Pluto a planet or not kind of thing. We'll also cover the regular constellations and planets and cool space stuff. We'll, we're, we're expecting a couple of big launches coming up. All of, the, uh, all of the billionaire folks that are building their own rocket ships are gonna be launching into space in the next little while. Good place for them. And uh, there's also a new module going up to the International Space Station. And we're looking forward to the launch of the new Boeing spacecraft that'll be going to the International Space Station on a test flight as well. All that's happening in the next uh, two or three weeks. Depending on when it happens, we'll be bringing that to you as part of the show as well. That wraps us for this particular show. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And um, please join us again next week. We'll be here at 7 o'clock. And we will be bringing you Dome at Home every Thursday all summer long. Thanks to uh, the, the great people at the museum. And thanks to my bosses who let me do this. Because this is a, this is a fun part of my job. And I really enjoy it. Uh, the community that we've built here. Thanks again. Have a wonderful evening. Get out there, check out the stars, uh, look for Venus. Remember, send us some mail. We always love to get mail. You can hit us at Manitoba Museum on Facebook or YouTube, space at manitobamuseum.ca for email. And uh, we love getting your pictures, your drawings, uh, your stories about observing the sky. Thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day, wonderful evening and we'll see you again soon.